Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Manning. I'm the Film Programs Manager here at the Bullock Museum. I hope everybody out there is doing all right and hanging in there. Um, thanks for tuning in and I also want to give a big thank you to our web and digital and marketing team for their work on this program. So let's give them a virtual round of applause. This is our first iteration of the Texas Focus Film Series Book Club and today we're going to be focusing on Allison Maycore's book Chainsaws, Slackers, and Spy Kids, 30 Years of Filmmaking in Austin, Texas. You can get access to Allison's book via our online museum store by going to thestoryoftexas.com. And now let's welcome Allison. Well, welcome Allison. Thank you so much for being with us today. How are you doing? I'm good, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, well, so I thought we could get started by you telling everybody a little bit about you, your role as a film historian, and also just a little bit about your book. Well, I am a nonfiction author and ghostwriter, and a, I have a PhD in film history. And um, the book kind of grew out of my experiences as a local film critic here in Austin. Um, while I was working on my PhD in film history, I was also a film critic. It sort of just happened by chance that I was doing the both of them at the same time. And um, as I was writing my dissertation in the late 90s, um, as much as I love academia and I taught for 20 plus years, uh, I really wanted to write a book that was more accessible, that wouldn't just sort of sit in the library. And um, so I started thinking about what could I write about? and. It was around 2001, and um, there were three things that happened, sort of in quick succession. Um, the movie Slacker had its 10th anniversary. It was like a big deal. It was at the Paramount. Um, it was an anniversary screening. Uh, the Film Society that filmmaker Richard Linkletter had started with some other people in the film scene. Um, that had its first Texas Film Hall of Fame, and that was kind of a big deal. And then just a few weeks later, Robert Rodriguez's film Spy Kids opened, and that was, um, you know, done here locally. Um, and it pretty quickly, within a month, went on to sort of break what was then the uh, blockbuster mark. It made $100 million domestically. And so that was a big deal for this homegrown movie to kind of break out. And for a sort of a family-friendly movie to break out at that time, it was around Easter of 2001. That was sort of an un... It's funny now to think back, but like no one thought, gee, you know, kids home for the Easter holiday captive audience why wouldn't we release a movie? And so it did really well. I mean, not just because of the time period, but it's a really great movie. And um, so those things kind of happened. And I remember thinking like, wow, you know, I mean, I felt an energy in the town. You could really feel like, wow, all these things are going on. And since I was covering, covering the film scene, you know, I was in the thick of it. And so when I would talk to people, they would say, oh, surely somebody's written that book already, written a book about the history of the Austin film scene, and no one had. And the thing that interested me from sort of an academic standpoint, just as a historian, was that people would say, oh yeah, the Austin film scene, that started with Slacker. And Slacker certainly put Austin on like the modern map in terms of filmmaking. But I knew, like as a historian, like, things had to happen before Slacker. I mean, what brought Rick here? You know, what, what made him even come here to start making movies? So that was really the inspiration behind, you know, looking back, um, what had happened in Austin in film and how did we get to that point in 2001? Mm -hmm. uh, so that really inspired me to write the book. And how long did it take you to piece everything together? Were there any... <laughs> Were there any like big road bumps or did it come together fairly easily? <laughs> um, it felt like a super long time. It took basically the researching and writing took about five years. And part of that was because I was working full time, you know, during that time. So I was sort of doing the book on the side, but I also interviewed more than 200 people for the book. 
and some really big names, Quentin Tarantino, Ann Richards, um, Bob Weinstein, and getting to people like that takes a little while. Um, I was really lucky once, you know, I started talking to people, then they'd make phone calls on my behalf and, you know, Rick or Robert called Quentin, you know, that kind of thing happened. Um, sort of the funniest, the interview that probably took the longest was with Matthew McConaughey. Um, he, I think I talked to, I, I basically chased him for about a year and a half. <laughs> Um, there was a two week window that I was given, like, he will call you between nine and five any day during these two weeks. So this is like 2006, you know, not everybody had cell phones and I mean, people had cell phones, but it wasn't like now. And so it was like, okay, I'm just waiting for that call. So the two weeks came and went, no phone call. I remember calling his assistant and saying, yeah, I never talked to him. And um, it was funny because she was very unflappable, but in that moment she became very <laughs> rattled. And um, anyway, I just had to move on with other interviews. And then just like on a Wednesday afternoon, my phone rang and I picked it up and somebody said, um, hi, it's Matthew. And I really, I was like, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. Oh, and he goes, McConaughey. And I said, oh, okay, hi, you know? And then, so then we did the interview. So you know, sometimes you just have to go on the fly with stuff like that. I'm imagining being in that moment and even hearing McConaughey and be like, what? I don't know. What are you talking about? Like, just like completely blank. <laughs> the thing was, he, I mean, you know, and we've never really met in person, but he, we talked for an hour and a half and he was very generous with his time because he was shooting, I think it was the film We Are Marshall. And I think that might have been his first producer's credit. So he was juggling multiple roles on that film. Yeah. So to give me that much time, you know, I've always been extremely grateful for that. And, um, you know, I always say he's very, un in my interview, my experience with him, he was very much what you see on screen. You know, he's laid back, he's casual, he likes to laugh. Um, uh, he told me this funny story I remember about, um, he knew Austin had changed when he was here and trying to make a right turn from that little like turn by the Y down onto Lamar coming off Cesar Chavez. <laughs> and, he, and no one would let him in. And he, for him, I think that was a turning point. Like, oh my gosh, Austin's gotten so big and nobody's being nice anymore. It was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, that kind of makes me think about, so that was a unique moment as far as putting the book together. Was there any specific unique moment or exciting point within your research that really struck out to you as far as like film history in Austin? Were you like, oh, this is major? Well, I mean, for me, you know, from the history standpoint, finding out that there was a movie made here called A Political Touchdown in um, 1915. Mm -hmm. And it was such a big deal that the local paper um, carried news of it every single day. So every day there was some kind of coverage, like, and this is where they filmed yesterday. And this is how you can be an extra, you know, so even in the teens, this was happening. And by that point, the film industry as a whole was, uh, you know, what, 20 years old, maybe a little bit less. Um, so that was one thing, you know, that movie filmed at UT and on the grounds of the governor's mansion and at the Capitol and in the Hill Country. And it was actually done here locally. You know, it was a local company. I think it was called Paragon was the filmmaking co company. And then it was released. It showed in like a hundred cities around the country when it came out. Yeah. So, you know, film history in Austin obviously predates the movies that we're familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. So that was one thing. The second thing was this book called To Wear a City's Crown, which is something I read for background to get a sense of, you know, it's a book that's about Austin, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, and sort of how those cities developed. And I thought that would be important for me to know. And um, basically the writer, uh, Kenneth Wheeler, um, said that I think Austin had the opportunity to like be a big railroad hub back in the 1800s, but it just was sort of like the city, you know, the fathers, city fathers at the time were like, eh, 
yeah, we'll pass. And I think San Antonio then, you know, was like, we'll take it. And it just made me laugh to think like that whole, like, you know, keeping it weird, laid back attitude was even <laughs> happening at that time. So that was a real fun discovery. Sure. Um, then it makes, you saying that kind of leads me to this idea of strings of thought that you found throughout some of the titles that you came across through that 30 year span. Did you find that there was maybe a motif or something that connected the many of the films that maybe translates to today or did everything kind of have its own specific place? Well, I think since the films I wrote about, you know, I wanted to focus on the films that were homegrown and then, then went on to national acclaim. So yeah. covers like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Slacker and um, a smaller film called The Whole Shoot and Match. And I, I think what, they share is they really, um, you know, exploited in the best sense of the word, Austin as, as a location, as even a character, um, you know, in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, the, uh, some of the filming took place just, you know, over where um, that flyover is just north of Wells Branch, you know, in the La Frontera area. Um, so, it, it, it was able to have like this kind of scrubby look to it then. And then in the nineties or really the late eighties, early nineties in Slacker, um, you know, that movie sort of capitalizes on the, the campus scene, you know, and, and all those places that used to be around campus, like, um, you know, the camp, the cafe, basically the cafe culture that that's not a name that I think, Rick Linkletter or anybody associated with the film would use, but it actually, the, the film came out right around a time when that sort of was becoming a trend of sorts on, um, in, around college towns like Austin. And so um, you've got that. So it's a completely different look and a completely different vibe in that film, but they both share the fact that they kind of milked um, Austin's characteristics, basically. It's diverse locations, which, ultimately made the city, you know, one of the places that a lot of people in Hollywood would want to come if they're going to make a movie, you know, on location in Texas. I think something that I gained from reading your book too, you do a really wonderful job of exploring that idea of the diversity of the spaces here. Mm -hmm. And I remember that when I moved here myself thinking, you can live in a small little world of Austin, like your space. And then when it expands, you realize, oh, I, this area looks totally different than this other spot. Um, when did you, you know, move here? I moved here in 2011. And it's, you know, I mean, of course, like everybody says, it's changed, but I've just noticed as I explore more, at first, there are times that I still feel like a tourist here because there's this whole little area that I haven't found or, you know, I just discovered. Um, and so that's kind of special. And you see that through film too. Like you just mentioned about Chainsaw Massacre versus Slacker, you see these totally different worlds. Um, and um, this series, I think, is going to feature also starring Austin, the documentary. Yeah. And yeah. that does a wonderful job. And, uh, you know, I should say I'm in it. So just <laughs> it right there. But it really does a great job of capturing that on film, you know, and you get to see this whole, you know, panorama of what Austin was and is. And um, again, that's one of its strongest selling points, I think, as a location and as a film community. Right. Well, so could you talk a little bit about film production here and what that looks like? I, for anybody in our audience who doesn't know much about film production, I would love it if you could maybe break that down just a little bit and what the ins and outs of that might look like. But more, more importantly, what it would have looked like to film in Austin without a permit back then versus now. Well, I mean, again, back to a political touchdown. So we're talking 1915, you know, there wasn't so much permits as, you know, there's crowd control to some extent. Um, and uh, when Richard Lake Leonard was making Slacker, it was in the late 80s, it's like 89, I believe, summer of 89. And um, so the recession, right, had hit in the early 80s, but the downtown area of Austin was still pretty deserted, you know, as an after effect of that time and just the banking fallout and all of that. 
Um, so he could go down there and he could shoot without any real worry about needing a permit, getting stopped by anybody. Um, there's that great scene with Teresa Taylor and Madonna's pap smear, you know, done in the downtown area. I mean, you could just do that and not have to worry about somebody holding traffic or anything like that, or, you know, getting permission to be on a city sidewalk. Whereas today, you do need permits to shoot, like, on any public space, basically. And I, you know, was kind of surprised. You don't need a whole lot of lead time for that, you know, in much bigger places you would. Um, but you still need to think about those things and you need to, you know, hire um, security or maybe police, off-duty police for crowd control and this and that and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so I guess to contrast them, it's become literally more of a production now. The city is four times the size it was when I was writing about it then, I think, or maybe, maybe three, th two and a half. <laughs> um, so there's just more people, you know, more to deal with, more traffic, of course. Um, and in fact, one of the scenes that I love is in um, office space where my judge um, filmed a traffic jam. Okay, a traffic jam. People should just go look at that then. This was 1998 when he was shooting. You know, that was a traffic jam in Austin, 1998, what it looked like. It's a great scene. Um, and, you know, he had to get some permits and it was on Breaker Lane and they had to get, you know, things in place. Um, I'm sure anybody who's watching this who's lived here in Austin um, has seen those saw horses around town with arrows pointing for crew, you know, uh, where the set is, that kind of thing. That's become more prevalent, um, obviously. Uh, so yeah, it's a different time. Um, but I think people like to shoot here because in a lot, a lot of ways it's fun and it's, it's still relatively easy to get around. And, you know, it's, it's a, a city with people who are used to those kinds of things. So that makes it easier too, for those who want to shoot here and easier for, to work with people. Sure. And in your book, you talk about, and just kind of, I'm taking note from what I remember that, filmmaking really started to thrive here in the 90s. So what do you feel like was the fertile ground for that? That's, I remember that note from your book, this idea of fertile ground. Is it what you were just speaking of or was there more to it? Well, I think it was a few things uh, in terms of film, like the film industry was shifting at that time and independent film was really rising up. It was filling kind of this gap where there was starting to be less um, of a middle ground. Um, there were blockbusters and then there were small films. And so, you know, somebody like uh, Linkletter could say, hey, I, I could make a movie and it could actually get shown somewhere around the country. And so that was inspiring a lot of people. Um, and uh, there were also, you know, the sort of what we know as the modern Austin film scene. I mean, Cruz had been working here for years by that point, decades. So there was a really seasoned crew base. Um, so people, then Hollywood productions can come in from out of town. And if they wanted to fill some positions, they could do that relatively easily because the talent was here. Um, and around the early nineties was when Ann Richards was governor of the state and she was very film and TV friendly. And she would made lots of trips going out to LA and going to California to recruit people to come, you know, Hey, come shoot in Texas. Um, you know, shoot here, shoot in the Capitol, that kind of thing. Um, and related to that, there were started to be some incentive packages and tax breaks offered to people who wanted to come in from outside and shoot here. Um, and though all those things are really important. That's the infrastructure to building a film scene or a, a you know, a media scene really. So that makes me think about something you're talking about the infrastructure. And so when I think about regional filmmaking, I remember, you know, when I first moved here and apprenticing with Austin Film Festival mm -hmm. and they used to, and I think they still do, they had a whole section of their festival that was focused on regional filmmakers. Yeah. And when I think about that now, it's kind of interesting because you think about Austin being a city where we want to focus on films made here, filmmakers that have spawned from this city. It's mm -hmm. a big deal. But if you look at a state like California, 
and films that are largely made in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I wonder if regional filmmaking has the same kind of impact there that it might here. And so my question would be, why do you feel like it's important to hone in on that, you know, regional filmmaking here? What about that regional filmmaking that you noticed in that 30 year span is still as important today? Why do we latch on to that? Well, I think it's about, and it's, it's you know, happening right now, it, you know, who are we seeing on the screen? You know, are we seeing people that we can relate to? You know, not everybody is, obviously. Um, and there was, you know, think about when, um, for instance, Chainsaw, Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out in 1974. Okay, in the late 70s, one of the biggest deals on TV at the time was a primetime soap opera called Dallas. Right. It did some shooting um, there out at the ranch, but, um, you know, it was this idea of um, over the top living and characters. And so there were people, some of these people who made these films, like somebody like Eagle Pinnell, who did the whole shooting match and Lynn Sutherland, who um, was his co-writer on that and producer you know, they looked, they're like, those aren't Texans I recognize, you know, so the regional film helps bring um, sort of a, a more of an authenticity, perhaps, to the screen. Um, and that's one reason it's important. It's also important to cultivate, you know, that kind of creative capital in, in, a, in a state, you know, no matter where you are. So I want to talk a little bit, I want to shift gears a bit and shift to um, Elizabeth Avion, because yeah. She's somebody that, you know, is noted throughout your book in connection to the career of Robert Rodriguez. But I wondered if you could tell our audience a little bit about Elizabeth, who she is and why her name's important to film and the filmmaking community. Well, Elizabeth is, she was one of my favorite interviews. She's such a warm person. I don't know her very well at all. We've, you know, just met but whatever met a handful of times but she's just a warm person um she and she and robert who's now they're no longer married um they met at ut she was working in the provost office he was working there part-time as he was finishing his degree or working on his degree um she has all of the skills of a great producer very organized uh, she's a people person um, she's very uh, nurturing, very motivating, and I mean, all of that on a very small scale helped Robert Rodriguez. You know, she was the one who said, hey, there's this film, um, Third Coast Film and Video Competition, you should enter something, and he entered his trilogy, Austin Stories, and that caught the, uh, that won the prize, I think, and, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. Um, so she's, she's just, she's not only, you know, um, sort of a good people person, she understands that there has to be an infrastructure. So she, when she and Robert were together, especially, um, you know, they were building their company and they were building it in a way to help um, also create something for the community as well. And so she, they were involved, she, maybe she more than Robert, because she was the producer, you know, on the incentives, on tax breaks, on those kinds of things. And, you know, she was getting involved politically. And um, I think she had a sense of the bigger picture. That's what a producer needs to have. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, she's, she was made herself um, available as a mentor to many, many people too, who were coming up. So that's important as well for future generations. Um, you know, going back to your point about regional filmmaking, you know, you've got to bring other people along too. Yeah, we, we interviewed her in connection to the faculty. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really struck me was exactly what you just noted. Um, her nurturing capability with the, the young people and the, in the cast of the film. Well, um, and yeah, huh? I was just gonna say, it was funny when I did my interview with her, I think it was 2006. A lot of these interviews, I, you know, I said, I, I don't know if I said this, but I worked on the book really from 2001 to about 2006. And yeah. a lot of these interviews came together at the very end, which, you know, was kind of crazy making, but that often happens. So she, at the time, she and Robert, I believe, had four boys, and 
just like in that week she had found out she was pregnant with a girl and she was so excited and she told me and she wasn't very far along you know and your mom I'm a mom you don't usually divulge that but that was one of the first things she said to me and then she's like are you gonna have children and I was like <laughs> <laughs> so you know she's she's very much um she wants to know about you and, and that was a fun mm -hmm. interview well so I'd love to leave our audience with for those who haven't read your book or maybe some who have what do you hope people take away from your book what's what are a couple of things you really feel like wrap it up for everybody um i just think you know it's i had such a fun time learning the behind the scenes stories of so many of these films that you know so many of us are familiar with that were done here texas chainsaw massacre slacker dazed and confused just coming up for its own anniversary office space so i hope readers you know, have that sense of fun, reading these behind the scenes stories, the kind of chaos, the problems, the triumphs, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and just get a sense of, you know, what's come before, you know, current, you know, contemporary readers may read it, especially it came out in 2010. So now we're talking 10 years later, um, you know, to go back and see, oh, so this is how those festivals started. This is why they're so important. So South by, West, South by Southwest started, you know, and was sort of in competition with the Austin Film Festival. You know, what was that like? That kind of thing. I think it's really important to know about the place in which you live or, you know, know the behind the scenes of the movies that you love. So I would hope that people would, you know, take that from the book. Absolutely. Well, I loved reading your book, no doubt. Um, and I did see your interview in uh, the Austin film. So, I mean, seeing what you said in that versus reading the book, you just gained so much more. So anyway, it's delightful chatting with you today. Thanks for being with us. You too. And I have to say one of, we were at the Bullock, um, one of the first times I took my son and we were in the gift shop and he's like, mommy, your book. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Really fun. It's so fun to see it there. Thank you for having it there. Of course. Well, thank you so much, Allison. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Bye. Bye. Thanks again to Allison for joining us today and discussing her book. And thank you, everybody out there, for tuning in. Don't forget, you can access Allison's book, Chainsaws, Slackers, and Spy Kids, 30 Years of Filmmaking in Austin, Texas, by going to our museum gift shop at thestoryoftexas.com. And you can also access more programming that we're doing there as well. I hope everybody stays well, and we'll see you next time.